Well, good morning, everybody. How are you doing, 830? Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hey, could you join me in giving a hand to all of our guests that are here in this service today and those watching online? We love you. Our church family that's online, we love you and we are praying for you. We're so glad you're part of this today. I say welcome, welcome, welcome. So glad you're here. Hope you are, um, just hope the Lord's doing a mighty work in your life during this 21 days of prayer and fasting. Um, I, I want to say to the church, thank you, thank you, thank you for being, um, just for leaning in. And I see you here in the mornings. I see uh, the stats of those that are watching online. Um, uh, just on Tuesday alone, over 174 unique devices watching online, over uh, and, and over 80 people here in the room. Um, God just is doing great things as we seek him. And so I just say, let's keep on keeping on. Maybe you had a hard week. Uh, I say start start again, start fresh and new. Don't get into legalism or guilt and shame with all this, but just start where you are and let God do a fresh work in and through your life. But I just wanna say thank you. I am so expecting, I, I felt like on Friday, I was over here praying um, uh, after uh, Dr. Pete spoke um, that morning and uh, I was reminded of the scripture whenever Jesus went into the wilderness, the, the father drew him into the wilderness to, to fast and the scripture says he came out in the power of the Holy Spirit and I feel like the Lord said that's exactly how we're coming out of this fast in the power of the Holy Spirit so just keep on trusting, keep on believing uh, let's keep on seeking the Lord and if you're new, brand new today uh, so what that looks like is We'll have prayer gatherings all throughout the weekdays at 6 a.m. here in person and online. And, uh, and then on Saturdays, it's at 9 a.m. As you heard, we have small group training right after that. So it's a great opportunity to come, pray, and then to find out more information about leading a small group. But I'm just so glad you're here and honored to uh, teach, teach today. Week two of our series, Pursuit, we're talking about pursuing the Lord. If you have your uh, Bible or your message notes, turn to Judges chapter 16. Hey, check this out on the screen. We did this last week, and we're gonna keep doing this, uh, especially in this season. We have online message notes. They're fill in the blank. You can fill those out, email them to yourself. You can see all of our upcoming announcements, all that, all those things. Um, and so just know from now on, that's going to be available. Cityhills.com slash notes, or you can scan the QR code and, uh, and, and go and fill out uh, the notes and uh, just follow along with the message today. But I'm just, I am so honored and thankful that you're here. And I don't know, but I just feel the presence of God in this place today. And so Lord, I just pray, Lord, our hearts are open. Lord, have your way. Whatever you want to do in this place, God, we want to be new. We want to be changed. God, I pray for anyone today here, Lord, that comes in here struggling. God, anyone here today with a broken heart. God, anyone here today walking through difficult circumstances. God, anyone here today dealing with anxiety or depression. Lord, Holy Spirit, would you come and do it only you can do. Lord, we are here, Lord, not to go through the motions. God, what we are here because you are the living God and you are able, God. I pray, speak, Lord, more than a message could ever say. God, let the Holy Spirit speak to our hearts and lives. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen, amen, amen. Uh, the scripture I want us to turn to is Judges chapter 16 and verse 17. The scripture says this, speaking of Samson, so he told her everything. No razor has ever been used on my head, he said, because I've been a Nazarite, Nazarite dedicated to God from my mother's womb. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me but I would become as weak as any other man. Verse 18, when Delilah saw that he had told her everything, she sent word to the rulers of the Philistines, come back once more. He told me everything. So the rulers of the Philistines returned with the silver in their hands. After putting him to sleep on her lap, she called for someone to shave off the seven braids of his hair and so began to subdue him and his strength left him. I want to teach today from this topic, wake up. Could you turn to your neighbor and say, wake up. I think this appropriate title in the midst of 21 days of prayer where we're waking up at 6 a.m., wake up. I don't know about you, but I love to sleep. Hallelujah. Can we just give God thanks for sleep? I'm so, I love to sleep. I think that's one of the main differences between childhood and adulthood the love of sleep. My kids think sleep is a terrible thing. They have not received the revelation yet. I tell them often, there'll be a day where you will beg to take a nap and to go to sleep. On uh, New Year's Eve, 
my kids, I, we tried to do, see, over the last few years, we found out a, a parenting hack for all of you that have small kids. We did a ball drop at 10 p.m. or in some years, 9 p.m. We did a fake ball drop via YouTube and, con and told the kids, it's the new year, and we weren't lying because it's the new year somewhere. <laughs> and we said, time to go to bed. Well, not this year. They wanted to ex have the full experience. And uh, my oldest came in and he said, Dad, can, it's the first time he's asked me this. Dad, can I pull an all-nighter? And I was like, no, you can't. Go to bed. <laughs> you know, there's two types of sleepers in the world, uh, heavy sleepers and light sleepers. How many heavy sleepers do we have in the, in the house today? Yeah, yeah, nothing could wake you up. I'm a heavy sleeper. Our house could be on fire. Anything could happen. Uh, I would sleep right through it and ask what happened the next morning. My wife, on the other hand, I have to tiptoe through the room because she will wake up so fast. There are uh, sl heavy sleepers and light sleepers. There are uh, snooze button people and non-snooze button people. How many non-snooze button people do we have? You're, you're, not, you're not about that snooze button life. You, you set your alarm for when you're going to get up, and you're so awesome. You get up about 10 seconds before the alarm even goes off, and you're ready to go. I, I know you're out there, but for the rest of us, I'm a snooze button person. I set about, I set about four alarms every single morning. The first one's just, just, it's just warming up. The first one's nice and docile, tranquil. Sounds like, you know, springtime. You know, it's just slow and easy. By the time you get to the fourth one, it is like an atomic bomb is about to go off in our house. And my wife usually is my alarm clock because she's like, turn off that alarm clock, you know. Uh, yeah, I was thinking about this story in Samson and this story in life and, and the reality that in, in the enemy's goal is to get us to snooze beyond our destiny. The enemy's goal for your life and for my life is that we would hit the snooze button of life. He's all about the snooze button, that we would stay asleep to the purpose and plan of God. There's all kinds of things that lull us to sleep along the way. And God wants us to wake up. This is a very a prominent theme throughout the writings of Paul and throughout the, throughout the New Testament. I want to show it to you. Ephesians chapter four, 5 and verse 14 says this. This is why it's said, wake up, sleeper. Rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful then how you live not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Romans chapter 13, verse 11. And do this, understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be alert, be of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. You don't, we don't see this uh, more clearly than in, in as any story in the scripture uh, than in the story of Samson. As Samson slept, the enemy destroyed his life. As Samson slept, Delilah, we read it together earlier, Delilah was interested in what was the secret to Samson's strength. Maybe the little backstory of Samson. Samson was a Nazarite. He was someone who was a child of God, a, a follower of God from a very early age. And God gave his parents a promise of what he would become and gave him a commitment, a, 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 um, a consecration, if you will, of what he was supposed to be. And he said, you're not supposed to cut his hair. And if he will have that uncut hair, he was also not supposed to touch anything dead. There were other things that went along with being a Nazarite, but it was a sign of commitment and sacrifice. And in the story of Samson, we see a slow but steady degradation of his character and of the purpose of him following the purpose and plan of God in his life. And he got to a point where he fell in love with a girl named Delilah that was part of the Philistine nation. This was the group of people he was supposed to be delivering Israel from, but rather he finds himself in bed with Delilah. And she's not there because of him. She's there because she wants to steal something from him. She's not there because she loves him. She's there because she wants to take something from him. And she continues to want to find out the secret to his strength. 
and it gets to this moment where we read it earlier, and Samson is destroyed, not by a gun, not by some strong thing. Samson is destroyed with a haircut. How many knows that's a bad haircut? Talk about a bad hair day. I should have called this message a bad hair day, right? You talk about a bad hair day. That's exactly what Samson had. I've had bad haircuts before, but this tops all of that. We, uh, we were at Thanksgiving. I can't talk about bad haircuts without talking about a few years ago. We were um, at family Thanksgiving in Indiana with my wife's family, and um, uh, my my boys, another uh, another uh, young person in our family. We had we had went off to go shopping, Kara and I, and we come back, and one of the other young people in our family decides to become a barber for the day and cuts Hudson and Carter's hair uh, while by himself while we're gone. And this is the picture uh, of that that day after. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> They look like Lord and Harry from Dumb and Dumber. That's a bad haircut. What was the big deal with his hair? You know, Samson, I was thinking about this. This is from the serve team party. Samson had an awesome rocking head of hair, everybody. He had it going on. He had it going on. It's probably a little bit longer than mine, but he had a rocking head of hair. And uh, the scripture says that she found the secret to his strength. And the secret to his strength was not uh, in anything that it would seem to be. It, the secret to what happened in Samson's life was, was this. Just a, just a little, little haircut. Just, just, just little, little. By, it wasn't something big. It wasn't something strong. If you would have said what would destroy somebody as strong and supernaturally as strong as Samson, you, you would think it, it would be a lot of things, but you would never think it would be something as simple as this. But, but I want to say this today. If you're taking notes, Samson's bad haircut represents the little compromises that compound and end up wrecking our life. Satan does not destroy our lives in some grand fashion. He destroys our life little by little by little by little by little. And I want today to, I, to challenge us to wake up. I believe there may be some people here today or watching online that you've been spiritually asleep and God says it's time to wake up. God has a great plan and purpose for your life. He wants to do something mighty in and through you, but you have to wake up. And so I want to share with you five things that were stolen away from Samson while he was spiritually asleep, while he slept that day, what the enemy tried to steal away from him while he was asleep. And it's the same thing the enemy wants to take away from us as we sleep. If you're taking notes, here's the first one. Number one, the blessing of vision. The scripture says in Judges chapter 16, verse 21, that the Philistines seized him, gouged out his eyes, and took him down to Gaza. Because of him being asleep, because of him compromising, because of him being willing to compromise on the destiny that God had for his life, he ended up losing his vision before he lost his vision. If you read the story of Samson, and I think you should, it's so good, but what you see is a slow but steady decision of losing vision in his life. Slowly but steady, he starts missing out on the call and the plan and the purpose of God. It's not big things, it's little decisions along the way that lead him to a place of, 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 of compromise. I want to say this, that you can't live for God without sacrifice. You can't live for God. Discipleship demands sacrifice, and Jesus never hid the cost of that. That Jesus said you got to deny yourself. You have to take up your cross. One group of people came and said, I want to follow you, Jesus. And Jesus said, you got to understand, I don't have any place to lay my head. In other words, I don't, I'm homeless. I'm just traveling from place to place. What was he saying? If you want to follow me, you're going to have to be willing to be uncomfortable along the way. 
You're going to have to be willing to sacrifice. And there are things and people today that say you can live for God but have no sacrifice. I want to say that will put you to sleep so quickly. But when we begin to sacrifice, when we begin to trust the Lord, when we begin to say, God, whatever you want to do in my life, God begins to give us vision and that the enemy takes away. The enemy stole his vision away from him. I want to ask you, how's your vision right now? How's your vision about your future? How's your vision about what we're walking through right now as a nation? How's your vision about your family? How's your vision about your work? How's your vision? Say, well, I'm just living life. You may be asleep. God wants to give you fresh vision for your future that you could see. See, it, it's not as important what you, what's happening around you. It's what the Holy Spirit is showing on the inside of you. God says, wake up. Don't let the enemy steal your vision. Here's the second thing, the blessing of strength. First thing the enemy took away was his vision. The second thing was his strength. Judges 16 verse 19 says, after putting him to sleep in her lap, she called someone to shave off the seven braids of his hair. And so he be, she began to subdue him and his strength left him. The enemy he used the enemies he used to defeat are now defeating him. He goes out. He tries to be like he was before, but his strength is gone because he was asleep. The things that used to bother him, the things he used to fight for, he's, he's no longer fighting for. He's, he's lost his convictions. Tell you what, as, as you follow Jesus, the word conviction is a great word to learn. It's a great word to pray about. God, give me personal convictions. God, I'm not, sometimes we can live for God. I, I've experienced this in my life where our convictions is just what our pastor believes or what our church believes or what we, you know, somebody else tell me how I'm supposed to live. But there's something powerful when you wake up and you say, God, what do you want? How do you want me to live? How do you want me to act? How do you want me to, to, to be? God, give me convictions in my life because slowly but surely, the things that used to convict us don't convict us anymore. Slowly but surely, the things we used to not do, we can kill, we, the, the enemy can lull us to sleep and it doesn't matter to us anymore and we do the things that the Holy Spirit used to convict us of, of not doing. C.S. Lewis says this, such a good quote. He says, indeed, the safest road to hell is the gradual one. The gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. I think it's so easy to imagine our lives being destroyed in a moment, but it's our strength being gone little by little by little. And I just want to say it's a big deal. It's a big deal when we get to sleep in, 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 our, in, in what God has called us to do. It's a big deal when we get to sleep in the things that we used to feel conviction about. I know I'm, this is a hard message, everybody, but I want to tell you, this will save your life because Samson, if he could come back, I think he would say in this moment, wake up, church. Realize don't be asleep by the little things that the enemy tries to take away. Here's some, here's some little things, just a little lie. No big deal, just a, just a little lie. Or, or maybe you say it like this, I don't really lie. I just embellish the story a little bit. I just round up. Or, uh, you know, this emotional affair at work or on Facebook or with an old, you know, flame, that's, it's not really a big deal. You know, God knows my spouse is not really meeting my needs and no big deal. Everyone else is doing it. Maybe you say things like, you know what, in a relationship, you gotta test drive the car before you get married, you know. No big deal. Everybody else is doing it. Uh, you may call it stealing from the company, but you know I'm not stealing really anything big. As a matter of fact, they haven't given me a raise lately, and I'm just trying to get some extra money. God knows I need some extra money, and, they, and they're not they're not treating me right. Or, or um, I, I know there's bad things in what I'm watching and what I'm listening to, what I'm reading. But but you know I'm grown. I, I'm you know I have the grace of God. It's 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 not going to affect me. I, I know it's not going to affect. Well, me, I, I can listen to that. I can, I can listen. I can watch. I can do that. I, I, I'm, I'm cool. I, I'm okay. Or, or they're cute. I, I know they're not a believer. I know they're not a Christian. Or they say they're a Christian, but I know that you know they don't like you know pray or like go to church or whatever. But you know what? God can do anything. Yeah, I, I'm a missionary trying to reach them for Jesus. 
Or, or about this, you know, it's just a little political post online. Yeah, I know it may be a stumbling block for other people in my church, but it's how I feel, and they just need to hear my truth about what I think. Or this, I don't do drugs all the time, it's just whenever I feel like I need to. I'm in control, no big deal. Or being a little flirty or dressing provocative, it'll, it'll never hurt anybody, no big deal. Or being alone with someone of the opposite sex is not really a big deal. You know, I do it for work. You know, everybody, everybody does it. I only look at porn once a week. It's, it's okay. I'm in control of it. Uh, I, I know my friend, my best friend, the people I hang out with, you know, they're, they're, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're not serving God. They're, they're, they're not leading me closer to God, but we've been friends for years. You know, what am I supposed to do? No big deal. I, I, I don't party every weekend. I'm just trying to be a witness. <laughs> Praise God. But this, this is my favorite one. I don't gossip. I just love sharing prayer requests. <laughs> <laughs> Can I tell you this? Satan wants to destroy your life. I'm your friend. I want to help you. He wants to take away your strength. And that when he takes away your strength, it leads you to the next thing he wants to take away. And that's number three, the blessing of freedom. I tell you the reason why he steals your vision. The, we, the reason why he wants to take away your strength is because he wants to lead you to a captive place. He wants to take away your freedom. It says, then the Philistine seized him, gouged out his eyes, and took him down to Gaza, binding him with bronze shackles. Samson used to be free and not bound by the enemy, but this moment of sleep led him where he had no freedom in his life. He thought it was no big deal. He thought it was just a fun fling with a beautiful girl. He thought it was nothing that would do anything in his life, but it led him to a place where he had no freedom. See, Satan is a trophy hunter. He's hunting after your life. He's hunting after my life. Just like a hunter today would say, what are you hunting for? I'm hunting for, you know, that deer that has, you know, this, I want, I want a big buck. How many points does it have? You know, it's got 10 points. Oh, that's awesome. I, I, Satan looks at your life and says, oh, I want, a, I, want a, I want a man with a big influence. I want, how many kids does he have? Oh, three kids. Oh, we'll destroy a whole generation that way. Satan is a trophy hunter. He looks at you young lady. He says, oh, who is she? Oh, she has great potential and she's gonna do something great for God. Oh, we can take her and we'll, we will get her through a relationship and we'll I know we'll get her because she's needing a relationship and she's needing a friend and before long the freedom is gone years ago I went to a uh, uh, I went, went went to Nashville to, to visit some friends who happened to be at a convention at Opryland Hotel and uh, they it was the uh, national I, I'm not I'm gonna get the acronym right but it wrong but it was the uh, it was the essentially the national turkey hunters convention convention and uh, how many knows your pastor's not much of a turkey hunter? I don't know anything about turkey hunting. I know, what, I know how to eat turkey on Thanksgiving. I know we have some great turkey hunters in the church. Shout out to Roger. I know you're watching, brother. But we have, uh, you know, turkey hunters. And I was there really just to see my friend. And he had a booth there and at this convention. And we were going through. And I was just overwhelmed all this hunting, all this hunting stuff. And uh, just all the calls you know, just turkey calls, you know, everywhere. And the sound, you know, the sounds, the smells, the turkey smells, you know, the, the you know, all of the, all the decoys, all the things. And I, I, I had an education that day that the whole, uh, the, the whole commerce around turkey hunting is built on attracting a male turkey with the scent of a female, the look of a female, the sound of a female. And it's all about a brother trying, it is Delilah trying to get Samson. <laughs> that old turkey, he just wakes up in the morning. He's living his life. Oh, strong Samson. And then he hears a, grub, 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 and he hears a beautiful girl, delight. Oh, he smells. Oh, she smells so good. And before long, he steps out of the clearing and boom, he's on the wall. <laughs> Tell you what, Satan wants to put you on his wall. Wants to put you on his wall wants to steal that from you. Here's the, here's the fourth, is the blessing of productivity. Productivity. He, verse 21 of Judges 16, binding him with bronze shackles, they sent him to grinding grain in the prison. 
Satan, I mean, Samson used to produce great results for God, and here he is just grinding grain for the enemy. See, God wants to use your life to make a kingdom difference. I just wanna say that. It's not an accident that you're sitting in this room today. I don't care how young you are or how old you are. God has brought you to this place, this season on purpose. It's not an accident that you are alive in 2021 and all you say, well, I, God could never use me. I wanna, tell you, I wanna tell you the exact opposite. God wants to use you. God specializes in using broken people just like you and me. He wants to use your life to be productive for the kingdom of God, not to be productive for the enemy's kingdom. There's one thing, I say it often, that God and the devil both agree on and that's the impact and the, the importance of you in their kingdom. Satan wants you in his kingdom, but God says, I can use your life. You say, I've made mistakes and failures. You can start again, and God can use you again. You say, you say, you don't know about me. I've been making mistakes recently. I haven't been on fire for God. Y'all been fasting. I've been eating cheeseburgers three meals a day. I say to you, you can start right now. Be productive in the kingdom. That's why we have next steps. That's what this is all about today. Next Steps is not for us. It's not for the church. It's for you. It's for the church. It's for you. You are the church. That The greatest way I know to be able to pastor this church is to lead you to Jesus and to help you discover those gifts and callings and passion in you so you don't go to sleep and start using what you're doing for all the wrong, for the wrong kingdom. What a tragedy if you live your life for the wrong kingdom. What a tragedy if you're successful in the wrong kingdom. We're called to give our gifts and talents and all the things that we are to the kingdom of God because the enemy wants to take away that productivity in the kingdom. That's why we're talking about leading a small group. What's that about? That's not for us. That's for the body. That's for our church family. Why? Because I know one of the greatest ways that, that you will be spiritually healthy and a blessing for your marriage and your family and all the things is if you will step into leading someone else along the way. The most, the most messed up people spiritually in the world are selfish people. The most messed up I get is whenever I'm all about brand and all about what I think and all about my needs. But when I step into it and I say, God, use me to make a difference, God, I don't know how to do it. I'm not smart enough. I'm not good enough. I don't, I'm not wise enough. I don't have all the answers. God says, that's okay. I'll take care of it. I just need your availability. And so I said, jump into it. God wants to make you productive for the kingdom of God. You say, I've never led a group before. That's okay. Find out more. You can co-lead with someone else. Jump in this Saturday. Lead a group. Find out more information. God wants to use your life. And you say, oh, this is out of my comfort zone. Good. You can never grow in your comfort zone. Good. That means God's doing a work in your life. It's a journey you'll never regret. Here's the fifth thing that the enemy wants to rob from you. The fifth and final thing is this. He wants to rob from you the blessing of God's anointing. That's one of the saddest verses in the Bible to me. Judges chapter 16, verse 20. It says, he called... Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and thought, watch this, I'll just go out like before and I'll shake myself free. But he did not know the Lord had left him. He thought to himself, I'll just go to church like before. I'll just go to work like before. I'll just do, go through the motions like I've done before. I'll just do everything like I've done before. But he did not realize that he wasn't strong because of who he was, but he was strong because of the anointing of Almighty God that is upon his life. See, the anointing is the power of God on someone's life to accomplish God's purpose. God's anointing is critical. Church, I don't want to preach without the anointing because it won't do you any good. I don't want to sing without the anointing because it won't do you any good. You shouldn't want to go to work without the anointing because it's not going to do any good. Everything we should want to parent without the anointing of God because it's not going to do any good. We need the anointing of the Holy Spirit if we're going to do what God's called us to do. Zechariah chapter 4 verse 6 says this, So he said to me, This is the word of God to Zerubbabel. Watch this, not by might. Not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. God wants to fill you with a divine anointing. Some of you are experiencing that right now in the midst of this 21 days of prayer and fasting. You're feeling physically weak, but can I tell you when you're weak, 
God is strong through you. When you're weak, there is a special anointing that's coming on your life. Don't let the enemy get you discouraged. Some of you may have dealt with discouraging situations this past week. I promise you it's the enemy trying to keep you asleep and trying to keep you discouraged and trying to keep you from pursuing God. You keep on trusting. You keep on praying. You keep on believing because God's anointing wants to come to you today. You say, well, Brandon, that describes my life. That's where I am. I've been asleep. I'm honest enough to say today, I've been asleep in some area of my life. I've been asleep in some area of my walk with God. What am I supposed to do when I'm asleep? What am I supposed to do after I've made mistakes? Well, I have good news for you today. I'm a preacher of good news. The gospel is good news. You may have made some mistakes in the past, but I wanna, sh I wanna share with you three important truths that I want us to wake up to today. And here's the first one is number one, you need to wake up to hope. You made some mistakes. You got a bad, bad haircut. You look over your life and you say, yes, I've got some bad haircuts along the way. I've made, been making some compromises in my family. You know, I've been making, I'm, I'm living some, some of the fruit. I'm, I'm bound in some areas because of the compromises and the haircuts that I've been having along the way. What am I supposed to do? You gotta wake up to hope again. You gotta wake up that the best truly is yet to come. You say, how could you ever say that or believe that of what I've gone through? How could you say that the best is yet to come for a man who is bound and he's blind and he's lost his productivity. It looks like there's no hope. You say, how could I ever have hope for my marriage? It's bound. It's blind. It looks like it's dead. It looks like it has no hope. I feel like I'm broken. I feel like I'm heartbroken. I don't know what to do. I want to share with you the next scripture says this. But the hair on his head began to grow again. But the hair on his head began to grow again. I want to say this, no matter how much you've messed up, your hair can grow again. No matter how much failure has been in your life, your hair can grow again. Your marriage can grow again. Your joy can grow again. Your ministry can grow again. Your calling can grow again. Your destiny can grow again. He, he can grow again. you got to wake up to hope. You gotta wake up to hope. You gotta take the things that you thought God could never heal that or God could never do that and you say, oh, by the grace of God, it can grow again. It can grow again. It can grow again. The scripture says this, Samson prayed to the Lord, verse 28 of Judges 16. Sovereign Lord, remember me. Please, God, strengthen me just one more time. God was not finished with him yet. God wasn't done with Samson yet. He said, God, one more time. That's my prayer that somebody would get a hold of that today. God, one more time. I'm talking to people today. Maybe this message is just for a certain group of people here, but I, I just really feel a burden for people. God's used you in a great way in the past, and I just want to say to you, one more time, let God do a work in your life. One more time, rise up and wake up into the calling. One more time, pray. One more time, fast. One more time, seek his face and just watch what he will do. God's grace goes so much further than your worst mistake. God's grace, say, well, I've run from God. I tell you, you, can't, you may run from God, but you'll never outrun God. He's waiting for you. you Gotta wake up to hope his hair begin to grow again. I feel like that's happening. Somebody's life today, it's beginning to grow. Your hope's beginning to grow again. Your joy's beginning to grow again. It's beginning to grow again. Here's the second thing Samson woke up to. He had to wake up to community. I love this. It says, Samson, here he is, blinded, bound. Here he's just, just grinding at the mill. Here he's being used for sport against the, for the enemy. And it says this, Samson looked over and said to the servant who held his hand, put me where I can feel the pillars, where I can feel the pillars that support the temple so I may lean against them. We're about to see Satan, we're about to see Samson's greatest victory over Satan. We're about to see Samson's greatest victory in his life. And one of the things you'll notice about Samson is Samson is always alone in the story. It's Samson fighting by himself. It's Samson doing it all. It's strong Samson 
taking the city gates down. It's Strom, Strom Samson taking the jawbone of a donkey and, and having victory. It's Samson all by himself. And I want to tell you, the way the enemy destroys your life, no matter how strong you are, is when you're all by yourself. It's when you're all alone. It's when you come to church with no intention of connecting with anybody else and you say, it's just all about me. It's all about me being alone. You heard Joel's testimony. Thank you so much for sharing that. He's in this service right there. Thank you, Joel, for sharing your testimony and your story. But what was he saying? He was saying, when I went to that men's group, there were other people that started coming around me and encouraging me and equipping me to do everything that God had called me to do. What did Samson have a re, re, what did he wake up to? He woke up to the reality that when I'm blind, I need someone else leading me that has vision. Whenever I am at a place where the enemy is destroying my life, that's not the time that I'm supposed to stay isolated. But he finds a young man who has vision. He says, take me back to the pillars. Take me to the pillars of this place because God was giving hope in his heart and hope in his life. And I say to this church, let's lean into community like never before. Mental, mental stress and strain and mental illness is rampant right now in our society. People are feeling so alone. And I say, church, let's be the solution. Let's be the answer. You say, well, I feel alone. I don't know what to do. Will you be the thing that you want to see? You be the thing that you need. You need community, give community. You say, well, I need some friends. Well, sign up and lead a group and you'll find some friends. The Bible says if you want friends, you show yourself friendly. In other words, you have to come to a reality where you wake up. It's not about me. I need people. I need people. I need each other. We need each other. This is not the time, church, to be fighting on Facebook. This is not the time to be putting our politics over the name of Jesus. This is not the time. All of that is nothing but a distraction from the enemy because he wants to keep people isolated. He wants to keep people divided. And more than the nation divided, I promise you, it's not even about the nation. It's about the church. Because as the church goes, so the nation goes. But I say, not by might, nor nor by power, but by his spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And right here from Knoxville, Tennessee, we're going to be the solution. We're going to be the answer. We need community. We need hope. We need to wake up to what God's called us to do. I say, wake up. Wake up. Third thing, final thing today, is you got to wake up, number three, to destiny. So Samson said to the servant, take me to the pillars. He prayed to God. And then it said, then he pushed with all of his might. And it and the, and came down the temple on the rulers and all the people in it. Thus he killed more when he died than when he lived. I was so inspired and encouraged how God can use us again how God has an unbelievable ability of taking what the thing the enemy thought, where he would get the last say. Hell stood there laughing with the Philistines. Oh, look at this great man of God. But he found hope again. His hair started growing. He thought, wait a second. I I know what that feels like. I know what that hair feels like. It's coming back. God's not done with me yet. There's hope again. And then he started getting around other people. Hey, young man, help me, take me to the pillars. Some of us, you have some pillars in your life. Some of, there's some pillars in your family tree. There's some pillars of addiction. There's some pillars of depression. There's some pillars of, of anger. There's some pillars. And, and, and you need to say through community, take me to the pillars. Take me to the place. Take me to what the enemy thought would be my dying place. And let me put my hands on it one more time. And as he put his hands on the pillars, he prayed and he began to push. He began to push on the pillars. What does pushing mean? I love this. I learned this as a kid. Push is an acronym for this. Pray until something happens. 
What are we doing during 21 days of prayer and fast? We're pushing against the pillars. What are we doing when we wake up at 6 a.m.? We're pushing against the pillars. What are we doing when we're pushing back the plate? We're pushing the pillars. And we're saying, God, let your power go in my workplace. God, let your power go with my kids to school. God, let your power be in my family. God, let your power be in my life. Let your power be in my destiny. God, I pray you would do a work in and through me. What happens? The anointing begins to come on his life. And he kills more in his death than he did in all of his life. If you turn to God, church, God will use you even greater. You're not dead because God's not done. Your impact can be greater. God wants to use your life. I want to conclude with this one statement here. You can't go back and change the beginning. But you can start where you are and change the ending start today every head bowed every eye closed I don't know who I'm talking to today this message is for you I want you to show up by a lifted hand right where you are say yes God I'm hearing you I'm ready to wake I'm feeling that alarm go off I'm waking up God I'm waking up God he's in this place hope you didn't just come to hear a message hope you came to experience the Holy Spirit and so right where you are I want you to say Holy Spirit what are you saying to me right now in this message it's what I prayed for at the beginning, that the Holy Spirit would speak. Why don't you say, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? Lord, we thank you that our hair grows again. We thank you that you take what the enemy meant to destroy our lives and you turn it for good. Thank you that you wake us up whenever the enemy steals things, God. I pray that someone would wake up from lethargy, wake up from those little compromises, wake up and choose sacrifice again choose to go after God, pursue God like they never have before. That you would use them, God, to change their world, to make a difference, God. Use them, God, to be a bridge builder, to be a difference maker, to be a world changer. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Come into this place. Revive us again, God. Revive us again. Take us to the pillars. Lord, we're pushing. We're pushing, expecting your anointing. Expecting your grace, expecting your favor. Do revival among us, God. Do miracles among us. Signs and wonders, God. We worship you in this place today, God. Lord, we